front of you today to bring the word of God. And I want to say thank you to you for making it here this morning. So can you turn to your left or to your right, to the people on your table, and say thank you for making it in this morning. Can we go ahead and just put our hands together for ourselves? Because I could as well be preaching to empty tables, you know. I could as well have done. Um, and I want to appreciate my husband also for this great privilege. You know, when you've lived with someone for 21 years, it's um, very easy, even those of us not up to 21, to take the people who are closest to you for granted. So, Pastor, I don't take you for granted. Thank you for this privilege. Can we appreciate Pastor Fuller, please? <laughs> Hallelujah. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, because in your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Holy Spirit, I just commit myself into your hands. Lord, you know that I am nothing without you. Lord, breathe upon me, breathe upon each and every one of us today. Let your word come forth in simplicity. Let it flow, oh God, let your spirit flow. Let our lives be overwhelmed with your light, with your spirit this morning. Lord, speak to every one of us from the youngest to the oldest and let every fear in our lives disappear in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Last week, we started with a topic, Pastor Minister last week, and he spoke on conquering the enemy within fear. So I'm just going to continue part two. So if you want to give it a title, it's conquering the enemy within fear part two. Amen. One of the fears for me is what I'm conquering right now. Because when I was younger, I was always afraid to stand in front of people. I was like, what will I even say? You know, when I stand, I'll just be saying rubbish. You know, and it was easy for you to hide because when you were not a Christian, it was easy to hide because, well, who will I speak to anyway? And then I became a Christian, and then I became a Sunday school teacher. The first day I was told that I was going to be teaching Sunday school, oh my goodness, I couldn't eat for like three days. I was fasting because I was so afraid. Even though there was a Sunday school manual, everything was there, you know, for me to look at, for me to study before I came that day to speak. I was so much scared because I thought I would just get in front of everybody and I would just look at somebody's face and I would just freeze and I would just forget everything, you know, that I wanted to say. So for each and every one of us here this morning, if we want to accept it and be true to ourselves, each and every one of us have got fears. For some people, it's the fear of spiders. For some, it's the fear of space. For some people, it's the fear of being in public. For some people, it's the fear of failure. You know, for some of us, it's the fear of, I don't want to be like my father, or I don't want to be like my mother. The fear of rejection, you know, you suffer from rejection all your life. And as a result of that, you don't want to be close to anyone anymore. You don't want to let people get close to you because you're just afraid that if you let them in, they'll let you down. So there are different kinds of fears. And last week we read from the beginning to the end, 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story of David and Goliath. We're not going to read it today because of time. But I will encourage us that we can study it later. Before I go into fear on its own, speaking about fear, um, I just wanted to deliberate a bit on David. You know, because for me personally, after like, I can't say how many years of becoming a Christian, I was made to understand that reading the Bible is not just like reading a novel. It shouldn't be to a Christian, to a believer. When you read the Bible, you should study it. And study means that you, all of us have been through school, are still in school one way or the other. You think about the thing you're reading. You try to appropriate it to your life at that moment. The lessons you can learn from what you're reading, the mistakes that the people in the Bible made. Thank God that the Bible is not a perfect a book with perfect people. 
there's so many people in the Bible that made mistakes. And the Bible also makes us to understand that these mistakes were made so that we that were coming after them can learn from them. So one of the greatest men that I love in the Bible is David. But you know that David had so many weaknesses. But God still called him his friend. God made a covenant with him. Israel is the city of David. It's everything is David, David, David. And you think for a man that was so weak, why would God mention him? Why would God dearly love him like that? But that's the God we deal with. So David, in 4 Samuel chapter 17, was sent by his dad, Jesse, to go to the battlefront to go and give his brothers. He had three brothers, sorry, who were in battle. And... The Bible makes us to understand, if you read 1 Samuel 16 and 17, that David was the youngest of eight sons, okay? Now, in Israel, I'm going somewhere, please stay with me. In Numbers chapter 1, verse 3, is it possible for us to display it on the screen? Numbers chapter 1, verse 3. In Numbers chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible makes us to understand that in Israel, you have to be 20 years and above to go into war. Verse 3. Okay, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. So thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. So we establish that those 20 and above are the ones who could go into war. So David was not part of the people that went into war. It was, it was only his three adults brothers that went into war. So David was under 20 years old when he killed Goliath. If you are under 20 years this morning, please, can you stand up? Come on, me, stand up. If you are under 20, please stand up. Go on, go on, go on. Are you 21? Sorry, excuse me. Are you 21? You are 21. You are 21. No, you are not. Okay. All right, so imagine yourself. Okay, all those of us standing up. Thank you, sit down. I'm trying to make a point. So David was not even qualified, okay, to go into war. And when I started to look at David's life, I started to look at a life that had every excuse not to be anything. Because number one, he was the youngest. How many of us are the youngest in the family? And every other person, your siblings, they look down on you. You know, they're like, you're the last one, you're this and that, you're that. Secondly, for whatever reason, I don't know why Jesse decided that David was the one that should go to the fields to look after the flock. Considering that the Bible makes us to understand from what we could relate to in Numbers chapter 1 verse 3, that David was under 20, so David was a teenager. Okay? Now, you live a teenager alone, you know, to go to the battle, to go to the fields, to go and look after a flock of sheep. And he was there day in, day out at night. And apart from that, <laughs> the worst one was when Samuel went to their house to anoint the next king of Israel because God did not tell Samuel who was going to be king. He just said, take your anointing hall, your jar of all, go to the house of Jesse, and when you get there, I will show you who the next king of Israel is. So Samuel, the prophet, obeyed, went to the house of Jesse, got there. And the Bible says he made all the sons of Jesse to pass before him. And then Samuel thought he was Eliab because Eliab was the eldest. Eliab was like Saul. Eliab was as tall as Saul. He was strong, you know. So Samuel in his mind thought that Eliab was going to be the next king of Israel. But after passing through the seven, God said no. And then Samuel went, by any chance, do you have another son? And Jesse now remembered, oh, there's one more, you know, he's in the field. And Samuel said, we're not going to sit down until you bring him. And then they brought David. That is rejection. Not from, your, not from outsiders. His father completely forgot about him. 
It was in the field with smelly sheep. What were the older ones doing at home? Where weren't they in the fields? And you know, when David went into battle and his father sent him to his brothers as well, when he got there, they started insulting. What are you doing here? You are too proud. You are this, you are that. And for some of us today, we have all these excuses why we can't be all that God has created us to be because somebody has said something. Because your parents were storm out to you. Because your siblings treated you badly. So if, because somebody somewhere, your teacher, whoever it was years ago, 15, 10, 20 years ago, I'm not excusing whatever they said or whatever they did. But nobody should be able to stop you from being all God has created you to be. I don't care who they are. David realized who he was. And that was why he was able to conquer the giants with God's help. So to the young people here today, I just said under 20, but if you are young, and all of us are young. To the young people here today, I just want to encourage you, you know, Find out why you are here, okay? Find out God's purpose for your life. It's not all about social media. It's not all about coming to school and graduating and getting married and having children. Life is more than that. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives. And the younger you are, when you realize it, the better for you. So don't waste your youth. David was like you. He was misunderstood by his brothers, rejected by his father, you know, in the backside of the desert. You know, there was a time, if you read 1 Samuel 17, when lions and bears appeared to him. He killed them. But what a time to be in for a young boy. Because... I was reading Bible commentaries today and some people were even saying, they weren't sure that David could have been between 12 and 15. Because if he's the eighth and then the first three went into war, let's say, okay, fine. There were two, two years in between his brothers and there were seven of them before him. So David, let's just assume that David was very, very young. He was a teenager, probably between 16 and 19. He might have been young. God, the Bible didn't tell us how old he was. But David's victory over Goliath was a victory of a life that was lived in the secret with God. He lived a godly life. And that was why David's defeat of Goliath was not because David threw a sling. No. David's defeat of Goliath was not because he could run. David's defeat of Goliath was not because of any other thing but the fact that David had a secret close relationship with God. He did not allow his upbringing, his situation as in, and his circumstances to deny him from being what God has created him to be. Today we give excuses why we can't be close to God. We give excuses why we can't serve God. We give excuses as young people why we can't serve well oh it's school you know there are young people out there in the world doing great and amazing things for god we need to raise an army of young people and as we celebrate sub church today for the second year anniversary we thank god because in love assembly hallelujah god is raising an army god is raising an army if the old people don't do anything then the young will take over so all of us have to wake up because you cannot give God any excuse anymore. You cannot say it's because I'm old or it's because I'm young. It's, it's because my father rejected me. David's father rejected him. It's because my family didn't treat me right. Oh, look at David's family. They never liked him. Even when the guy brought food for them, they were still insulting him. No, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, David, for bringing food. Nothing like that. So, I just wanted to emphasize on each and every one of us relationship with God. Are you close to God? Or are you, you are just up and down? Like you, you, today you are up, tomorrow you are down. You're just giving excuses why you cannot serve God. Young people like you out there, married people are doing great and mighty things for God. And it's high time we rose up and join them because God is raising an army. Amen. Amen. So, we should be close to God. David lived a life of holiness, complete holiness and dedication to Jehovah. And that was 
why when David confronted Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, you know, David didn't go out that day thinking he would kill a giant. No. He went out that day going about his normal business, you know, because some of us are like, oh, okay, so how do I know if God has called me into ministry? It's not until you hear a booming voice. Most of us, I didn't hear any booming voice. Things just happen after one another like that, one by one. Oh, I was this, a Sunday school teacher. My Sunday school teacher became the pastor of our church and it, because I won the Sunday school quiz for my state. My Sunday school teacher said, oh, you're going to take over my class. And I was like, what? When he became the pastor of the church, I was like, I can't do it. You have to look for somebody else. And he was like, no, you've got to do it. You know, when I became a Sunday school teacher, I didn't think I was going to end up as a pastor. So God's call comes in different ways. David went out that day just to supply his brothers with food. But because he was an anointed young man, a man that God has set aside to fulfill destiny. When he got to the battlefront and he saw Goliath and he saw and he heard the things Goliath were saying and he heard how Goliath had instilled fear in the children of Israel for 40 days, he knew if God could help me when I was by myself to kill the lion and the bear, then how much more will God not help me to deal with this uncircumcised Philistine who has come to defy the armies of the living God. So we need to develop our relationship with God. Amen. So we thought, I, I don't know if some of us have had some of us might have, some of us might have not. This acronym for fear, F-E-A-R, F stands for false, he stands for evidence, a stands for appearing and R stands for real. So fear is false evidence appearing real. It's not real. Most of our fears are not real. You know, Job says somewhere, he said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. Some of us, the situations we're in right now are, is because of fear. Some of us cannot move forward with our lives because of fear. And that is not what God wants for our lives. We're afraid of tomorrow. We're afraid of lo losing our jobs. We're afraid that, oh, if I get married, I won't have children. Some of us are afraid that, are afraid of getting married because we've seen other people who are close to us, their marriages breaking up. So we're afraid, oh, if I get married, my marriage will fall apart like, like my parents' marriage fell apart. Some of us are afraid of dying because our mothers or our dads are dead. They died at a certain age and as you are approaching that age, you are afraid that the same thing is going to happen to you because it happened to your parents. So fear in, fear out everywhere. But it's false. It's not even happened. There's no, there's, it's just an evidence that appears to be real. And whatever our fears are, we have to confront them today. Amen? And that's what David did. If you read 1 Samuel chapter 17, when David put the stone in the sling, and the Bible said at a point, he hasted. At that point, I believe David was afraid. He hasted. That means he stopped for a minute. And then he ran towards Goliath. We need to confront our fears. Some of us deny it. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not afraid. But you know the thing that has held you all these years, why you've not been able to do that particular thing. You, you know what you're meant to do quite rightly. You know. You know the things God wants you to do. You know where God wants you to go. You know the things that God wants you to accomplish. Some of us are like, oh, I'm afraid. You know, I might never have children. We, know all, we, we have all these things running at the back of our minds. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Okay, have you seen that place? Yeah, 48. Sorry, you can leave it there for now. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came and drew night to meet David, that David hasted, and then he ran. So we need to stop running away from our fears. We need to start confronting them. And that's what David did. David ran. 
towards Goliath. Now, Goliath was nine feet tall. Goliath had been a soldier from a very young age. And Goliath was very intimidating. What are the situations and the circumstances that are facing you today? In your life, what are the intimidating things that you cannot even tell anyone? That are so insurmountable that they are they're like overwhelming to you and, you. and you cannot even see a way out. Let's look at how this young boy. Because if you look at uh, Second Timothy one seven first, before I come to David, thank you. Second Timothy one seven. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of discernment. So we are going to read it together. If you don't remember anything else that I said today, please don't forget the scripture. I want to go? Can we go? For God has not given me. Praise the Lord. So instead of us, it's personal now. Because my fear is different from your fear. Okay? What I am afraid of is different from what you are afraid of. We are sitting close to each other. Sometimes you are afraid of things to the extent that you cannot even tell your spouse. The closest person to you. I've been there before. When this medical condition came, for three days, I could not even tell my husband. I was so afraid. I was shaking. I couldn't speak. I couldn't speak. That is fear. Okay, so let's go. For God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Fear is from within. Fear is not something you can see. It's a spirit. And the greatest battles that we fight are in our minds. God wants our minds. Satan wants our minds. The battle between fear and faith. So, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. David was not a soldier. He was just sent to the battlefield to give his brothers food. So we're talking about confronting our fears. Okay, practically, how can I confront my fear? First of all, can I say that you cannot give what you don't have? Our problem nowadays is that, and I'm not preaching at anybody, I'm talking to myself as well, is that we are lazy. Okay? We don't want to study the Bible for ourselves. We prefer to be on next Netflix or a Roku or YouTube, Roku TV. You can watch a Roku TV from morning till night, but just read like two verses of the scripture. Mm -mm, you can't do it. Oh, it's very boring. The Bible is boring. But then in the middle of the night, when the fear comes, when you're about to do an exam, and you know for the past three exams that you've done, you've had panic attacks. Please tell me, is Iroko TV going to help you when you're having panic attacks? Iroko TV is not going to help you. Neither is Netflix or whatever or Instagram or Twitter. It's not going to help. It is the word of God that we use to confront the fears that are in our lives. If you don't have the word of God inside you, on the day that the fear comes, what are you going to do? We run to pastor. We, pastor does not have a magic wand. He's not a magician. Whatever you are going to meet him and say to him, whatever he's going to tell you, is from the word of God. So why don't we study this word for ourselves? And I'm not talking about reading the Bible. No. I'm talking about meditating upon what you're reading until it becomes part and parcel of you. My children that I'm teaching in my class, I tell them that you need to know the word of God for yourself. Because there's sometimes you have nightmares as a child. Before you run to daddy, daddy, mommy, mommy, mommy. Just say Jesus. You know, you teach your children from a young age to know the word of God. Let them learn memory verses from the Bible. So David confronted Goliath with the word of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 17... From verse 45 to 47. What did David say? Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. 46. 
This day will, I, will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee one, and take thine hand from thee two, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved no with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, the why was this young boy so confident? Because he had a relationship with God. And David coming out that day was not the first time he would face a battle. He has been facing many battles. He had had fears where a lion came. Imagine a lion appearing to you, to you as a teenager. As you are sitting down there now, imagine you going home today and a lion is running towards you. You know, because we just, we just, we just, when we read the Bible, we're like, ah, is it not lion? Is it not bear? David just killed the lion and just killed the bear. Can you kill a lion? If you, if you go to a zoo now, uh, well, maybe it might not happen in this country for, for whatever reason. You go and visit a zoo and then the cage, you know, rips open where the lion is and the lion escapes. In fact, Without seeing a lion, just hearing the word lion, you just heard lion. You've not seen the thing. You just heard the word. Some people are already dead. They've already gone. I will be gone. But look at a teenager. When he was in the fields, watching over the flock of his father, he said there was a time the lion came to kill one of the sheep. He killed the lion. There was a time a bear came. And bears, they, don't know, they just eat you up, you know depending on what type of bear it is. And David killed the bear. What was his confidence? His confidence was in the word of God. Hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter, let's read Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, first of all. Joshua 1, 8. Now, how many of us have had a cold before? If I had cold, I'm always having it, but... So I'm getting older, it's getting better. Raise up your hands now. We're in church. We've all had cold, flu, viral infection, whatever it is called. Now you go to your GP, right? When you've had a cold, and they give you a prescription, whatever it is called. And then, you know, you go to the pharmacy to pick up your prescription to use it. And maybe it's like some of them are like, oh, use it after food. Swallow with water, all this and that. Okay, if your GP says to you, this prescription that I'm giving to you, you're meant to use it for like seven days. Okay, so two tablets in the morning, two in the afternoon, two in the evening after food, swallow with water for seven days. And then you do it the first day. You do it the second day. You do it the third day. And then you stop. What's going to happen? Unless God heals you anyway. So let's take the healing part out of it. I'm going somewhere. So unless God heals you, please tell me what's going to happen. You're not going to get any better. Because you didn't complete the dosage. Okay? You didn't complete the dosage. So that is what happens to us as children of God. We go to God and we pray. So first, first month, nothing happens. First year, second year, third year. So nothing happens and then we stop praying because oh God has not answered so I might as well stop praying so why do we give up on the word of God when you don't give up on this prescription that your GP you take it religiously even for some of us who are parents when your child has been given tablets or whatever you text them have you taken your tablet today you call them i'm sure you have some of you your mothers have called you from far far away so have you taken that tablet today so why do we give up on the word of god after some time that is our anchor that is the only thing we have when we talk about meditating upon the word of god let's look at joshua 1 8 this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate upon it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid 
neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wheresoever you go. For the next one minute, please, can everybody close their eyes? Including the children, everyone, please, can we all close our eyes? And everywhere be still. If you're on your phone, drop your phone. I want you to think about what you are afraid of right now. The person beside you does not need to know about this. God is saying to you, don't be afraid. Today, starting from today, confront that fear. Confront that fear with my word. Learn for my word to be inside of you. So I want you to say to that thing that, is, that has made you so afraid, that has paralyzed you, that has made you to stop being yourself, that has made you to stop being the happy-go-lucky person that we know, that has made you to be so jelly-wise that you are so panicky. You used to be strong. You used to be the one encouraging other people. But because these situations and circumstances are in your life right now, you have become afraid. Your self-confidence is gone. Even your confidence in God is completely gone. But today I have come to encourage you that God is saying to you, my son, my daughter, do not be afraid. I want you to begin to say to that thing, to that thing, to that situation in your mind, to that fear that says you will never have children, to that fear that says who will marry you, to that fear that says you will never be successful, to that says, fear that says your mother died young and you look so much like your mother, you are going to die young, to that fear that says no man will ever love you, to that fear that says you will never pass that exam, to that fear that says your marriage will collapse, to that fear that says you will not live in good health, to that fear that says you will lose your job, to to that fear that says that you will not be all that God has created you to be. You know what these fears are. Begin to confront them right now with the word of God and say to that fear, no. This is what the word of God says about me. The word of God says I will be the head and not the tail. I will always be above and never beneath. The word of God says in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17 that no weapon that is formed or fashion against me shall prosper and every tongue that rises up against me in judgment shall I condemn. The word of God says with long life will he satisfy me and show me his salvation. The word of God says I shall be above and never beneath. Do this exactly I confront you today and I say that as I read, as I study in the library, my efforts shall not be in vain. I am no more afraid because fear brings torment, but every torment stops on today. In the name of Jesus, I command every fear to go because God has not given us the spirit of fear. In love assembly, we declare that we are a spiritual house, we are a people of power. God has given us the city of Liverpool. He has given us buildings. We are not afraid afraid of moving. We are not afraid of going to the next level because we have a work to do in this city. Because we are a spiritual house. We are a city that has been set on a hill and we cannot be stopped because we are an army. We are an army that is advancing. Advancing and confronting the enemy. We are no more ready but stop being afraid of that land manager. Confront that fear this morning because that land manager is just a mortar. That person is not your creator. That some of us here who are afraid of people, you say to God this morning, Lord, give me the boldness, give me the wisdom to know what to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for helping us, oh God, to confront our fears. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can open your eyes. Thank you. So, the word of God is very important for us to have the word of God in our hearts, okay? And I was talking before about, you know, meditating. Now, to meditate means, you know, all these positive thinkers out there, they took it from the Bible. We that we are children of God, we don't know what we have. We don't know the power and the authority that's in the word of God. So the word of God is our life. It's quick. It's powerful. In Joshua 1, 8, it says you will meditate upon it day and night. You know, like the way... When you have flu or whatever, you religiously take the dosage of whatever tablet your GP gives you. Start taking the word of God like that. 
So morning, you take a particular dosage. Afternoon, you take it. Evening, you take it. You can have your quiet time with God anytime. If you rush out in the morning, you have space in between lectures. You have space. You have lunch breaks. You have times during the day when you're not doing anything. Let your, our first priority, love assembly, from now on be the word. Let's entrench ourselves. So meditating means you think deeply, okay, about what you're reading. You think deeply about it. And then you think of how you can apply it to your life. Because the problem with us is that when we say, oh, the month of March 2019, you know, giant slain faith. Some of us don't know how to apply it to our lives, but it's quite easy. So giants, what are the giants that are confronting you? Those are the things, those are your fears. So what God is saying to you, us this month is that as we have those fears, we should confront them like they we did. We should stop running away from our fears. Because you're not going to, if you keep running away, there's no way you can advance forward. There's no way you can go into the future. Some of us are afraid of what the future holds. But if you remember that God holds the times in his hands, then you will not be afraid of tomorrow. Amen. So how do we confront our fears? You confront your fears by making sure that you study the word of God daily. If, you, if it's a new thing for you, if you want to see me after church, I can show you from, make sure your phone has the U version um, Bible app. You know, because actually we don't have any excuse. You can go on a Bible plan. You know, if you know that reading the Bible by itself for you is going to be strenuous. It might be boring. But the main thing is that you ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And by the time you start studying the Bible and the Bible comes alive to you, you realize that it's not boring because you are seeing yourself through the pages of that Bible. You are seeing the things that you can learn. You're relating. Our problem, one of our problems is that we don't relate the Bible stories with our lives. We don't understand that everything from Genesis to Revelation has to do with us. Jesus has given us examples of the people that have gone before ahead of us, how they overcame all these things. Look at the story of the young person we're reading today, David. So medit you study the word of God and then you speak it out. That is meditation. Meditation is not only reading. Meditation is speaking. What did David do in 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 45 to 47? He was speaking to Goliath. That is what you do. You speak to your fears. You confront them. That's how you confront them. And you don't just speak any word. You speak the word of God. If you don't speak the word of God to your fears, because the word of God is quick, it is powerful. Hebrews 4.12, it's a, it's, it's a double-edged sword. The, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So every situation that is confronting you that is dead, every mountain that is saying to you, you cannot go forward, every fear that is inside of you, when you speak life into that situation, life and death, they don't stay in the same house. It is not possible. When you speak the word of God that has life into the situation that you are going through at any point, the life-transforming power in what God's word will turn things around for you. But we don't have this life transforming power. We don't make use of it. We can talk about anything from morning till night. But we don't, talk, we don't speak the word of God. We don't speak the word of God into our situation because we don't know the word of God. We don't know the word of God because we don't study it. We don't study it because we think it is so boring. But that's your power. That's where you get your strength from. That's where you get your power from, from a, as a child of God. So you need to get close to the word of God daily, meditate upon it, think upon it, and speak it. Stand in front of the mirror. I do it. Oh my goodness. I stand in front of the mirror in my house and I speak to myself. And I call myself by my full names. And I say this situation, it will not defeat you. Because this and that and that. You know, so you have to start from somewhere. Even if it's a verse of the Bible. That you read every day. 
read that verse, think on it, or ask the Holy Spirit, where should I start studying? Because that's what, that was what this young man did. Then said David. So David went before the giant that was confronting him at that point and began to speak. You know that Goliath who spoke. Goliath cursed David by his gods. But David came and said, mm -mm, I am a child of covenant. And I invoke the covenant that I have with Jehovah today because you are an uncircumcised Philistine. You do not have any covenant with Jehovah. So the Lord goes of the Lord of the host of heaven. Invoke your power because I have a covenant with you. Come and fight this battle. So do you think when David was just running to, towards Goliath, Goliath was just saying, even if, okay, let's say Goliath even stood in one position, right? Because this is how I read the Bible. If he stood in one position and David was running towards him, Goliath, even if Goliath, because Goliath is a man of war, is he just going to stand still and be watching, okay, so the stone is going to come. So let the stone come. So stone come, oh, come, oh, hit me on the head. It's either Goliath was running or was staying. Whatever Goliath was doing, the God of the angel armies, the Lord God of hosts, the commander in chief of the host of heaven, he just needed to send one angel and just say, just make sure that you stand behind Goliath. As, Goliath, as David is just throwing the stone, whichever way Goliath is moving, angel just move his head. Just make sure his head stands in the same direction because there's no way. Listen, people, how did short David, okay? Because when we read the Bible, we have to think. How did short David throw a, put a stone in a sling and threw it at a nine feet giant? And the Bible said that the stone entered the forehead of the giant. Please, how, does, how did that happen? Tell me, how did that happen? Because David invoked, that day, Goliath saw David, but behind, beside David, in front of David, around David were angels who were mightier than Goliath. They were not seen to the visible eye. Because David says something. Um, go back to 47. 46, sorry. 45. There's a particular scripture. You know why David said that? The God of the armies of Israel. What verse is that? Okay, 45. But I come to you. So as David was saying, but I come to you. In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. God just said, let's go people. He just said to the angels, let us go. Because David knew whom he served. David knew there was no way I could kill Goliath on my own. So he was very wise. He invoked the covenant that he has with Jehovah. How many of us are children of God here? Confidently, can you say, how confidently, sorry, can you say that you are in a relationship with God? Because that was what saved David that day. Because in verse 46 of, was it 47? He now said, Sorry, 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. Because Goliath had, had everything. His sword was like, Goliath's sword, David could not even carry. Okay? For the battle is the Lord's. And immediately David said the name of the Lord of hosts of heaven. The hosts of heaven were released. And they fought that battle. And there is no time God fights a battle and he loses. No, 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 no. It may take time. It may take some years. But that battle, if you hand over the battle of your... God will only defend those who are in, cov in covenant with him. God will not defend you. It's not, it's not a cause. It's not being, this is not a matter of being politically correct now. If you are not in a relationship with God, you cannot invoke the covenant of God to work for you. It is not possible. It's, in, it's the person that when you are in a covenant with someone, the Bible says, just like with Abraham, it said the lesser is blessed by the greater. So to every covenant, there are two people, there are two parts, there are two sides. So as children of God, we're in a covenant with Jehovah. So we have our own part to fulfill. Obey God's word. Do his will like David 
did as a young person. Don't spend all your time partying. Okay, so what is where is that going to get you? You know, you have when you know where you are going, some things you don't even do because you know that other people might be doing them. David was always in the desert playing music, playing harp. It was what you know after this battle when he went back home. It was still, he went back to that desert, and when he went back to the fields, Saul, who was the king, then one day the spirit of madness came upon Saul, and they were looking for who would calm Saul down. And somebody said, there's a young boy called David. He's always playing the harp. How did they know? Because David was on the fields. Boy, you are anointing. You know, it will speak for you. So you, we all have to make sure we're in a covenant with God. We're in a relationship with God so that God Almighty can fight our battles. Amen. So how do you confront your fears? You confront your fears by making sure you study the word of God. You meditate upon it day and night. Apply it to your life. And live a life of holiness. No, that's not something we preach about in church today. Watch yourself. You have, you have colleagues, like we learned last week, we have to, there has to be boundaries. You have classmates that you want to bring to the Lord, but they are talking about people and you are joining them to talk about people. They are making fun of people. You are always the first person there. Now, when you now say give your life to Jesus, they'll be looking at you like, are you crazy? What are you telling me to do? What's the difference between us? There's no difference. You know, the way they dress is the way you dress. You know, the way they talk is the way you, they get drunk, you get drunk. You know, there are a lot of pressures out there. But I'm sure David will have pressures in his time as a young person. And to those of us who are older, some of us are so familiar with God that we, we don't even think anything can happen in our lives anymore. We take God for granted. We take the grace of God for granted. We take the goodness of God for granted. Some of us don't read our Bibles apart from when we come to church on Sunday. Even when we come to church on Sunday, some of us are busy talking in church. When they ask some of us, Sunday school is always the children. And the, uh, they are the children in my class. I purposely don't talk when questions are being asked in church so that it does not look as if, oh, I've been... You know, because I'm the pastor or one of the pastors that I know everything already. That's why I keep quiet. But the adults, what are we doing with our lives? We are not too young, you know, to serve God. We are not too young to rise up. And like I said, if we don't rise up, sub church will rise up. Sub church, can you say amen? amen? Sub church will rise up. The young people will rise up because those of us that are old, we come to church. Some of us come to church. We are not serious. We don't come for Bible study. We don't come for prayer meetings. We don't do anything anymore because we just think we know God. We know what God is going to do or we know what the pastor is going to say. But when the battles of life comes, then we remember church. But the point is, every single day when we gather together, God renews our strength. Things are happening. And we have to come to the point that we we realize that this life, your life is not about you. The day I realized that I was shocked that my purpose in life does not have to do with me. My purpose in life has to do with the people that God has sent me to. So I cannot afford to be lazy. I cannot afford to, be, to say, oh, it's not easy. You know, this life is not easy. It's not easy. I have to go to work. My children are there. My job is there. School is there. This is there. That is there. God's purpose, there are people waiting for you. You have the solutions to their problems. But when you yourself don't even know who you are, how are you going to be a solution to other people's problems? That is purpose. Purpose is you providing solution to people's problems. For your purpose in life, it's not everybody like me that wore the microphone. Some people are going to be GPs. Some are engineers. Some are medical doctors. Whatever field you are in, that is your purpose. If you don't know what your purpose is, I am telling you, but go and ask God for more clarification. That is your purpose. God is sending you to that domain to rule and reign as kings and priests. So in that domain where you are going, there are giants there. So don't think because, because this error has been touching, taught in the church of God for a long time that when you become a Christian, everything is going to be fine. That's a lie. No. In fact, when you become a Christian, when the challenges become more, because the enemy is fighting you, 
the devil is fighting purpose. He realizes that if I allow this girl, if I allow this boy to progress, if I allow them to unleash what is inside of them, then they are going to, you know, create ripple effects all over the world of young people coming to Christ, of people getting saved, of people getting healed. And then when you get to your office and you're very confident, hey, yes, God has sent me to be a light to this generation. And then you get to your office and then you meet this line manager who is like the child of Satan. And you're like, God, ah, but you said you have given me this city. God said he has given us this city. Why did um, the people that locked CrossFit, why did they lock it? doesn't look at, like that. But what we have to realize, I was telling someone, I said, God has a sense of him, you know. God, if you had just wanted us to move out of CrossFit, you have just come in one service during prayer meeting. And just said, my people, my people, in this big booming voice, please, can you just move out of CrossFit now and move into CrossFit? But God doesn't work like that. We're always praying, God, take me to the next level. Lord, I want to go to the next level. You want to go to the next level. For you to go to the next level, there are going to be problems. And it's when there are problems, when you face those giants and you step out, we have to stop running. We have to run towards our giants like David did. As we do that, the Lord of hosts that we serve will back us up. And then they will make a way where there seems to be no way. Hallelujah. Can we rise up on our feet this afternoon and begin to thank God? I want this song to be played for me, please. No longer slaves. Can we get some YouTube? No longer slaves. As we close our eyes, once again, please start addressing the fear. There's no internet. Okay, Sapphire, where are you? I need you, please. Thank you. Can we close our eyes, please? And, you know, like I said before, you know, this thing has to do with you. So don't even look at the person behind you, beside you now. Your friends that you came to church together, it doesn't matter. Their fears are different from your fears. So you have to start facing your fears right now. If it's possible for some of us after this, just write down these fears. Get a notebook or your phone or whatever. Write them down and ask God one by one what God wants you to do. So shall we close our eyes as we begin to thank God. For we are no longer slaves to fear. We are children of God. God has taught us this morning since last week that he started. That he wants us to confront these fears. And we have realized that how do I confront my fears? By making sure that the word of God, Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 talks about renewing our minds our minds have to be renewed the battle you're fighting is in your mind our minds have to be renewed by the word of god so thank the lord this afternoon thank him for the fears are gone because you are no longer a slave to that fear whatever way whichever way however that fear came with the word of god it is going this morning father we just thank you Please make sure you are praying for yourself. Make sure you are praying for yourself. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because every fear is gone. In the name of Jesus. No more slaves to fear. Every fear is gone. In the name of Jesus, receive your liberty this afternoon. Because in so ever the Son of God has set free, He's free indeed. Hallelujah. No more send me. We are no more in bondage. God has set us free. We are no longer slaves in the name of Jesus. I am a child of God. Please lift up your hands to heaven as we declare the word of the Lord from Psalm 27. And please, you will declare this loud and clear. Just lift up your hands to heaven. Father, we just thank you. Just repeat after me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, 
came upon me to eat up my flesh they stumbled and fell though a host should encamp against me my heart shall not fear though war should rise against me in these will I be confident one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple for in the time of trouble the Lord shall deliver me he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret of the tabernacle shall he hide me he shall set me upon a rock and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy I will sing yes I will sing praises unto the Lord in the name of Jesus please thank God for delivering you from whatever fear it is fear of failure fear of self even fear of the devil please declare I am free I am free I am free just declare whatever fear that you know has been tormenting you father we thank you because we are free and he that the son of God says free is free indeed Lord we receive your word that you have spoken to us today through your daughter your word will prosper in our lives your word will accomplish what you please and you will confirm every word with signs following in the name of Jesus please stretch forth your hands Lord stretch forth your hands towards um, um, towards my wife please just stretch out your hands Lord we just thank you for what you have said to her and through her and to us Father, we feel refresh, restore, renew, feel again to overflow. And thank you because, Lord, you are her strength and her salvation. And, Lord, you are the strength of her life. She fears no evil. We declare and cover her with the precious blood of Jesus. Father, we just thank you. In Jesus' name we pray amen and amen and amen please clap your hands all you people just rejoice and be glad in the same vein we're going to do so many things at the same time please bring out your offering bring out your offering your thanks bring to the storehouse and let's take the offering and uh, we'll just take a song i don't know who's taking the song today and we take the offering please the ushers please let's do that quickly we want to celebrate the sap church so we want to quickly move move and move we just thank god so the ushers please can you hurry up they will go around uh, you drop your offering you have an envelope you are a uk tax player please you can sign the envelopes Please can somebody come and start from this side so that somebody starts on that side and then we can move quickly. And then somebody can just pass the basket. Are we ready? I praise you, my Lord. I praise you. There is no one else like you. In wisdom, in love, in beauty and power, oh Lord, there is no one like you. Almighty God, Father of all, King of kings, for the works of your hands I give. 
see if we will play. Let's listen to the announcements quickly. And if it doesn't play, we'll just, we'll just read it out. Uh, let's pardon the, the technicality here. We're still trying to get the system working perfectly. Uh, please, can I have a Gifted envelope, please. Well, while we're trying to figure that out, let me just um, are we okay? It's not working. All right, if it doesn't play, thank God God has not uh, silenced our voices. Um, my voice is back. Yeah, maybe we'll just need to speak. Right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, please welcome somebody around you. Just ask them, is today your first time in the Crawford House? <laughs> but tell them, Love Assembly meets in the Crawford House. We meet in the Crawford House. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Please, um, 
if it will be possible, all our heads of departments, I just need five minutes of your time before we leave this place. Just five minutes. I'd like to meet with all our heads of units. Sorry, we don't call them heads of units anymore. We call them leaders. So please, all our leaders, it will just be very, very, very brief, I promise us. Um, and then uh, we'll, we will be releasing a public notice uh, sometime this week. So please let everybody uh, just check their WhatsApp group. Uh, if you belong to any of the WhatsApp groups in the church, uh, there have been some developments, some decisive developments, which we would like to pass to everybody. But I want us to just brace up um, as a church um, that we, until further notice, we will be having all our services in this building as God has opened the door to us uh, to this place. Please, let's celebrate that. You are not celebrating unless you want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we will clarify that. Uh, but part of the clarification we need to make is that um, the trustees of the church and the church leadership have met to make a, f a, a, a decision. And uh, let me give you a hint of what that decision is. If you find out that what you want to buy is uh, it is seven thousand five hundred pounds cheaper than what they want to sell it to you. Will you buy it? Okay, you didn't hear me. You wanted to buy something, and then you found out that it is, it is 7,500 pounds cheaper. I'm not talking of 87 pounds. It is 7,500 pounds cheaper. And uh, the people who want to sell it to you are saying, no, you have to pay what you can get for 87,500 pounds cheaper. Will you go ahead and buy it? Some people are not getting it. Will you go ahead and buy something that is 87,000? Only the people here say no. Please, the people there, go ahead and buy it. <laughs> 87,500 pounds. Let the whole world hear loud and clear. We're on Facebook Live. So we will not go ahead to buy that, so we're going to release a public notice about that. So please just be on the lookout for that. But as God will have it, uh, we have this place and we'll be using these facilities until further notice. Please let's lift up our hands and thank God for giving us a property of our own. No, I didn't say clap, lift up your hands and thank God. <laughs> giving us a property that no man, no devil will strive with again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just thank you. Amen. Now, you know the beautiful thing? The beautiful thing is that the church is not a building. The church is me, you, a people. So you can lock a building, but you can't lock a church. Jesus said, I build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. So on Thursday, we will be having our Thursday Bible study. Hey, who is this I'm looking at? Is that? Is that? Is that Charlotte? Are you sure? Okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass Charlotte. But that is Charlotte. <laughs> wow, Charlotte. Sorry, at times I just forget I'm on the pulpit. Please, somebody welcome Charlotte there. Please, quiet, just welcome Charlotte. Welcome Charlotte. Please check, is there any other Charlotte on your table? Please tell, ask somebody, are you Charlotte? <laughs> right, so Thursday we have Bible study at 7 p.m., um, 7 to 8.30. Friday we have a prayer meeting, outpouring prayer meetings, getting more powerful and more powerful, 7.30 on Fridays. And Sundays we have our worship services. So we have, uh, those are the meetings for the week. Please, the people there, you are distracting me. Yeah. Forget about it, it's not playing, so forget it. So Wednesday, we have the cell group meetings. Uh, in every home, all the men have cell group meetings in their homes. All the men say amen. 
All the men say amen. amen. All right. So, um, and then we have one for um, singles, students. There's always one every week. Where's that happening this week, Sarah? Do we have a venue this week? Okay, there's a WhatsApp group, and uh, they will tell you where the cell group meeting. The cell group meeting is just smaller units of the church where we come together. We just need a minimum of two people gather and study the book of Acts. I have one in my house um, with my wife and uh, my two boys. So we do that every week also. So just take some time, read some scriptures, study together and pray together. And then on Thursday we come and do the general Bible study. It's always very, very good and healthy. Amen. Is there any other announcement I've missed, Pastor Sarah? Okay, do you want to talk about SAP Church? Um, we have our service today at 1.30, and it's going to be our second year anniversary, so you are all invited. Where? Um, Queens, where's my phone? Queensland accommodation. It's just like opposite where the old Tesco used to be, like Jack's now. So I start at 1.30, so basically we should be on our way now. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Please celebrate Sarah. Let's appreciate Sarah, because she started the... God used her to start the SAP church. She's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Amen. Uh, I think that's all. I just need the leaders, please. Five minutes of your time and that's it. Uh, please grab somebody's hands uh, around you. Grab somebody's hand. Grab somebody's hand. Grab them. Please tell them we're in the Crossford house now. And we're in this together. God has delivered us from Egypt and from Pharaoh and their horsemen let us enjoy this glorious liberty and confront this fear together because Goliath his head has been cut off the sword is in the hand of Goliath and we have used it to cut his head off welcome to this glorious liberty in the name of Jesus, I will give you it is seven thousand five hundred pounds. The money I, was, I will have given to Pharaoh, I prefer to give it to you in the name of Jesus. Tell them, take it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> the Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you, and the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. For all our visitors in the house, please welcome on this new journey, and we thank you. Please feel free now to invite people, tell them we're in Crawford House now, and uh, bring them along. Okay, you want to say something else again? Okay, there's a church van that will be taking people, okay, only SAP people, very discriminatory. And the teenagers, and only the SAP and the teenagers, That's thank you for... Uh, racism in the house of God. All right. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, there's tea. There's some sandwiches. Please grab something on your way out. Uh, there's a cafeteria just close to the entrance. Please, all the leaders, all our leaders, can you please step forward here? Step forward, please. All.